Hello, I'm Eric Huang. You're listening to Saint Podcast, a podcast about the always fascinating and often controversial lives of the saints. This is a history and culture podcast that traces the origins of morality tales of the saints, or hagiographies, through queer and feminist stories, ancient legends and lore, art history, and pop culture. The current season of Saints Podcast is dedicated to mystics, saints who had transcendental experiences with the divine. Over the next six episodes, we'll meet saints who had prophetic visions of the future. We'll explore the legend of a nun who suffered from transverberation, literally a burning arrow of love that pierced her heart and entrails. We'll also encounter a peasant whose heavenly visions foretold victory as a warrior. Episode 5 in the Mystic series is about a saint who was devoted to St. Francis' rule to live in absolute poverty. She defied her aristocratic family, powerful bishops, and several popes to do just this. This saint is the first female founder of a monastic order. She was a celebrity in life and played a role in defining 13th century European politics, accomplishing all of this whilst confined within the walls of a monastery. This is the story of St. Clair, the mighty abbess in the shadows. Most of what we know about St. Clair comes from three hagiographical sources. The first is the Acts of the Process of Canonization, commonly called the Acts. The document is composed shortly after Clair's death in 1253 as evidence to support her canonization. It's a compilation of testimonies from 21 people who knew Claire intimately. The other two sources are hagiographies based on the Acts, one of which, referred to as the Legend, is thought by many scholars to have been written by Thomas of Celano, the hagiographer of St. Francis. According to these sources, Chiara Alfreduccio is born in Assisi, Italy, on the 16th of July in the year 1193 or 94. Her father is Lord Favarone, the son of one of the highest-ranking families in Assisi, whose bloodline is said to emerge from ancient Roman nobility. Chiara's mother, Ortolana, is also an aristocrat. She's renowned for her piety and undertakes dangerous pilgrimages to Rome, Santiago de Compostela, and also the Holy Land. According to witnesses in the Acts, Claire has a vision later in life about her mother Ortolana that foreshadows future greatness. Claire's mother, when she was carrying her, went into the church. While standing before the cross and actually praying for God to help and protect her during the danger of childbirth, she heard a voice telling her, you will give birth to a light that will shine brilliantly in the world. It's because of this vision, the voice from God, that Ortolana names her child Chiara, Claire in English. The name means bright. It's the word that gives us clear, clarity, and clairvoyant, the ability to see clearly into the future. The political climate in the Europe of Claire's youth is one of tumultuous change. The barter economy of feudalism is on its way out. Cities like Claire's hometown, Assisi, are attracting more and more people who abandon agriculture to make a life in the developing urban centers. This results in an upwardly mobile middle class called the minores. Among their most successful members include merchants whose wealth and land holdings rival the hereditary riches of the aristocracy. We saw in the St. Francis episodes how a young Francis, the son of a prosperous textile merchant, yearned to acquire the one thing that separated him from the sons of nobility he desperately emulated, a title. Claire's family is one of these titled nobles, real aristocracy. We don't know much about Claire's childhood, but it's safe to assume Lord Favarone moves his family to Perugia, along with the other nobles of Assisi, to flee a rebellion by the Minores in 1201. Claire would have been six or seven years old. St. Francis and his family participate in the rebellion, on the side of the merchants, the losing side. After three years in exile, 
Lord Favarone and the aristocracy emerge as the victors and return to Assisi to reclaim their place at the top of the pyramid. A few years after the failed rebellion, Francis has changed his ways. He now lives as a pauper and devotes his waking hours to preaching a message of peace and penance. Scholars are in general agreement that Clare first encounters Francis whilst he's preaching in or outside the Cathedral of San Rufino, which is close to Clare's family home. By the time she's first aware of Francis, Clare is a teenager. They eventually meet in private, but it's unclear if it's Clare who seeks out Francis first or the other way around. It's likely Clare doesn't meet Francis alone. She's either escorted by her sister or by a friend and lady-in-waiting named Bona. Maybe all three visit Francis together. Francis and Claire have several private encounters over the course of at least a year. Bona tells us these meetings are conducted in secret. Meanwhile, Lord and Lady Favarone, who have no idea Claire is meeting with Francis, are in the midst of negotiating a marriage alliance for Claire. Here's some more detail from Acts. Her father and mother and her relatives wanted her to splendidly marry a great and powerful man in keeping with her nobility. But the young woman, who was at that time about 17 years or so, could in no way be persuaded because she wanted to remain a virgin and live in poverty. According to Claire's sister, Beatrice, it's Francis's influence that galvanizes Claire to refuse every suitor, then resolve to leave her family to join Francis's movement. Claire and Francis hatch an escape plan. The pair enlist help from a handful of sympathizers. Both of Claire's sisters are likely accomplices and would later join her. Another co-conspirator is Bishop Guido, the spiritual leader of Assisi, the man who was so supportive of Francis in the early days and presided over the spectacle in which Francis disrobed, then left his family as well to live in poverty. There's a story in the legend that takes place the morning of Claire's escape on Palm Sunday in the year 1212. Bishop Guido conducts mass attended by all of Assisi's most prominent families. He notices Claire in the pews, who's obviously troubled by anxiety. Anxiety that's been brought about by the approaching hour of her escape that very night. In a break with convention, Bishop Guido approaches Claire to personally hand her a palm frond, distributed to parishioners on Palm Sunday to symbolize Christ's arrival in Jerusalem. Later that night, after everyone has gone to bed, an 18-year-old Claire leaves her family home under the cover of darkness and never returns. Claire travels six kilometers, about four miles, outside the safety of Assisi through the countryside to Porti Uncula, a modest church Francis has repaired and maintains as a base for the rest of his life. It's at Porti Uncula where Francis awaits Claire's arrival along with three of his closest friends, brothers Philip, Bernard, and Rufino. Brother Rufino is also Claire's cousin. Francis holds a pair of scissors. Claire removes the veil that covers her head to expose her long hair. Francis cuts it off, giving her a tonsure, the halo-like hairstyle of a monk. With this act, Claire symbolically becomes one of Francis's followers. There's no time for celebration, though. Claire's family will soon be in pursuit. Claire exchanges her fancy clothing for a beggar's tunic. Joined by more of Francis's brothers, the group hastens to San Paolo delle Abadese, a Benedictine monastery about four kilometers away. That San Paolo is the place where Claire finds protection immediately after her abscondence suggests her escape had been long in the planning. The monastery is special. A papal order by Pope Innocent III decreed in 1198 that anyone committing violent acts on the property not sanctioned by the local bishop would be automatically excommunicated. Claire's family would be denied communion and therefore place their souls in peril if they were to attempt to violently remove her from the premises. For Claire to be admitted into the monastery so soon after her escape means the abbess in charge must have been contacted about, consulted on, and ultimately agreed to the escape plan. It's very probable that Bishop Guido influenced all involved, 
and might have been the mastermind behind it all. Francis and Claire would require the assistance of a high-ranking man in order to enact a plan like this. Although any evidence pointing to Bishop Guido as this man is purely circumstantial. Hi everyone, thank you so very much for listening to Saint Podcast. If you like what you hear, please consider supporting us on Patreon. For as little as the cost of a cup of coffee every month, your patronage will help keep Saint Podcast going, as well as unlock access to bonus episodes, a behind-the-scenes peek at what we do, and free Saint Podcast merchandise as part of your support. Head to www.patreon.com forward slash Saint Podcast. As always, Saint is spelled out. S-A-I-N-T. Thanks again for listening. The next morning, word of Claire's disappearance reaches her family. Here is a passage from the legend hagiography that describes their attempt to bring her back. After the news reached her relatives, they condemned with a broken heart the deed and proposal of the Virgin. And, banding together as one, they ran to the place, attempting to obtain what they could not. They employed violent force, poisonous advice, and flattering promises, persuading her to give up such a worthless deed that was unbecoming to her class and without precedent in her family. By taking hold of the altar cloths, she bared her tonsured head, maintaining that she would in no way be torn away from the service of Christ. It's Claire's uncle, the powerful noble Monaldo, who leads the men to San Paolo. Once Claire reveals her tonsured head and grasps the altar, which is a symbolic gesture claiming sanctuary, Monaldo and his men accept defeat and leave. Scholars have commented on the absence of Claire's father in this affair. Had he died? Is he away on business? Or is uncle Monaldo in charge because he's the eldest and the favored of the Favarone brothers? This last theory is backed by some accounts of Claire's story that name Minaldo instead of her father as the figure behind the marriage arrangements. So it's Uncle Minaldo's will that Claire defies. A few days after the drama at San Paolo, Francis and Brother Philip escort Claire to yet another monastery, San Angelo di Ponso. Scholar Catherine M. Mooney speculates that the Benedictine house wouldn't have been an appropriate place for Claire not if she's a follower of Francis. The aristocratic Benedictines collectively own property, contrary to the most basic rule of the Lesser Brothers. Unlike San Paolo, San Angelo isn't affiliated with any official order. Its occupants are female recluses, lay persons who devote themselves to contemplation, prayer, good works. The unregulated practices of this group is perhaps closer to Francis and Claire's visions of how to lead a religious life, Perhaps it's the abbess of San Paolo who demands Claire leave due to the disturbance caused by Minaldo and his knights. It's also possible that San Paolo was always designed as a temporary base for Claire, a location protected by the Pope's decree where she'd shelter only long enough until her family had given up. Lastly, Francis and his brothers were in the midst of repairing the Church of San Damiano, which would soon become Claire's permanent home the base for the order of women she'd eventually lead. A short stay at San Angelo might have been necessary to accommodate the construction schedule. Or maybe the stop at San Angelo was a strategic one, part of an even bigger plan. Fifteen days after Claire leaves home, only days after her arrival at San Angelo, Claire's sister Catherine joins her there. Claire's relatives, led once again by Minaldo, track down Catherine. Having already accepted the loss of Claire, they're determined that this time, Catherine's coming back with them. And they'll employ any means necessary. There's no decree against violence at this monastery. Scholar Joan Mueller describes the scene in her fantastic book, The Privilege of Poverty. Twelve men went to San Angelo and demanded that she return home. Catherine persisted, saying she did not want to leave Claire. At this, one of the knights became angry, and hitting and kicking the young girl, attempted to drag her off by the hair. The other knights joined him, striking and dragging her, ripping her clothes and pulling out her hair. As her sister screamed for help, Claire prostrated herself in prayer. 
Suddenly, so the story goes, Catherine's body lay transfixed on the ground and was so heavy that the twelve men were not able to move her. Others running to the scene from the surrounding fields and vineyards tried to help the knights, but could not lift the body. Minaldo and his men are thwarted yet again. We're told the defeat so enrages the uncle that he raises his fist to strike Catherine dead. Just as he's about to deliver the death blow, an excruciating pain paralyzes his arm. It only fades when he lowers it and departs for good. Later that day, Francis tonsures Catherine and renames her Agnes, after a 4th century Roman martyr who also defied her family to choose a religious life and death rather than the life of aristocratic luxury she was born into. A few days after the arrival of Catherine, now called Agnes, the sisters leave San Angelo for San Damiano, where Claire will live for the rest of her life. It's probable that the two women share San Damiano with male members of Francis's movement, though in separate sleeping quarters. Male priests are the only people permitted to conduct Mass and to perform the sacraments necessary for a Christian life. A revolving door of additional brothers also reside at San Damiano in between preaching tours. This includes Francis himself, who makes an occasional visit, as well as Brother Rufino, Claire and Agnes's cousin, and brothers like Elias and Leo, who become Claire's friends. Claire and Agnes don't preach. It's forbidden for women to do so. And there's no concrete evidence to suggest they travel far from San Damiano like the men do. The sisters likely remain close by and work at the nearby leper hospital. Or perhaps they remain semi-enclosed inside the monastery, where they beg for alms, pray with, and comfort those who stop by, especially the sick. Many miraculous healings are attributed to Claire. A brother Stephen, afflicted with an unnamed mental illness, is sent to her by Francis. She takes him in, makes the sign of the cross over him, and puts him to bed in the monastery. When he wakes up the next morning, Stephen returns to Francis, a healed man. From eyewitness testimonies and acts, we know Claire practices mortification, self-harm to chase away sinful thoughts, and reach an altered, mystical state of mind to be closer to God. She sleeps on a mat fashioned from twigs, or on a roughly cut plank of wood. When she's unwell, Francis strongly urges her to sleep on a less uncomfortable bed of straw for the sake of an easier recovery. She reluctantly obeys. Claire also wears a hair shirt under her tunic, designed for the sole purpose of irritating and inflaming her skin. As we'd expect, Claire's fasting practices are just as rigorous, which Francis and Bishop Guido forcibly compel her to relax. Despite the high, if extreme, standards Claire sets for herself, she never expects her fellow penitents to endure the same level of self-denial and self-harm, and understands that each individual has their own limits. First-person accounts of Claire describe her only as kind and full of compassion. More and more women join the two sisters at San Damiano, some sent by the friars and Francis himself. Others are acquaintances and friends of Claire and Agnes, aristocrats who donate their fortunes to the poor before joining. In addition to the high-born penitents are serving sisters, commoners, women from poor families, and so-called fallen women. Many are orphans. In other female monasteries, it's the serving sisters who tend to chores. At San Damiano, the chores are shared equally. Claire herself washes the feet of her compatriots in an act of humility. Nevertheless, a hierarchy based on class still exists. The serving sisters, who are permitted to come and go freely, run errands for the enclosed daughters of nobility. The majority of serving sisters are also illiterate, leaving the educated members to lead prayers and tend to managerial tasks that require knowledge of Latin and mathematics. It's only the high-born women who embroider and sew in exchange for food, supplies, and in Benedictine monasteries, for money. Acts mentions Claire's skill at making corporals, the white linens used during communion. Aside from this class structure, it seems Claire and Agnes's early life at Damiano is largely unregulated, quite flexible like that of Francis's brothers. 
The most stringent rules govern the ownership of property and the maintenance of chastity. The loose rules followed by San Damiano are part of a document given to Claire by Francis that only survives in a textual reference written by Claire towards the end of her life. In it, Francis promises Claire that he and the Friars Minor will always take care of the women at San Damiano. This oath will soon be put to the test. Change is in the wind. In 1215, at the close of a two-and-a-half-year conference of bishops, led by Pope Innocent III called the Fourth Lateran Council, the Church adopts 27 new canons or rules. Among them is a decree preventing the formation of any new religious orders. The 13th century sees a vast diversity of lay religious movements come into existence. A worrying number are unregulated, adopting practices and philosophies that are in direct conflict with the mainstream church. At the close of the Fourth Lateran Council, anyone wishing to found a religious house must do so under the banner and rules of an existing order. The execution of this rule, however, is inconsistent to say the least, and it takes years to implement. Decades, actually, for any real consistency to finally settle. Pope Innocent III had already implicitly recognized Francis's unofficial order, the Friars Minor. According to Thomas of Celano, six years after Claire leaves her family, Francis enjoins her to become the leader of the female wing of the organization, the Abbess of San Damiano. The legend tells us Claire only accepts the role out of the obedience she pledged to Francis the day she joined him. As abbess, Claire doesn't shy away from the menial tasks she performed in the past. Anecdotes demonstrating her continued humility abound in acts. Claire is quite an unusual leader. She institutes a very democratic system whereby a consensus must be reached before any rule is adopted or changed. The election of a new abbess is also democratic, and the sisters can later remove her if they deem her unfit to serve. This is in stark contrast to other monasteries, in which the abbess's will is law, to be obeyed without question. Hildegard of Bingen, whom we covered earlier this season, certainly did not run her monastery like Claire does. Installing Claire as abbess of the poor ladies, as they're now referred to, is perhaps a tactical move on Francis's part. Church officials had already begun instituting new rules to regulate the lesser brothers, whose unconventional total rejection of property was becoming more and more of an issue. Rules to rein in the women are likely imminent. Luckily, there's a reprieve. Pope Innocent III dies in 1216, one year after the Lateran Council's decrees are published. The new pope, Honorius III, entrusts a bishop and lawyer, later a cardinal, named Ugolino, to continue Innocent's work. The objective is as much about combating heresy and centralizing control as it is about uniformity of practice. You'll recall from the St. Francis episodes that Ugolino is an early supporter of the Pavarello, and he supports the female Franciscan movement coalescing around Clare as well as other female-led monasteries popping up all over Europe. But the very philosophy of absolute poverty that underpins every Franciscan, male or female, is a worry. Ugolino witnesses the plight of monasteries, particularly female monasteries like Claire's, that are confronted with real peril when donations dry up. He also has legitimate concerns that the need to beg in order to live is a distraction from prayer. The rule of St. Benedict, written around the year 530, has a simple solution. Benedictine monks and nuns are also forbidden from owning property. The wealthy men and women who join a Benedictine monastery don't give away their possessions to the poor. They donate it to the monastery. The basic needs of Benedictines are provided for by substantial endowments, so individuals can focus exclusively on religion. Another complicating factor is local clergy. A significant number of bishops amass the wealth of monasteries within their see or jurisdiction for personal gain, a widespread practice Catherine M. Mooney rightly calls predatory. 
It's these issues that Ugolino addresses in a letter to Pope Honorius III on August 27, 1218. The recommendations Ugolino proposes in the letter are approved. Female orders without an existing rule, the numerous houses of female penitents, must now adopt the rule of St. Benedict, which insists on the communal ownership of property to provide an income and the enclosure of its women for the sake of 13th century decorum as well as their own safety. One change is perhaps more controversial within the church itself than with the female penitents it governs. Every female order associated with the Franciscans, and some that aren't, is immediately transferred from the jurisdiction of the bishop to the direct rule of the Pope. This is significant because all revenues from monastic landholdings and assets are now accounted in Rome rather than within the wallets of the local bishopric. This doesn't go down well at all. In 1219, with the support of the Pope, Ugolino writes a rule to unify the various groups of penitent women living all across northern Italy, including Claire and the Poor Sisters. The rule of St. Benedict is its basis. It takes several years for Ugolino's rule to roll out, decades for any real sense of uniformity across the continent, due in large part to local dioceses simply ignoring and defying the rules, especially with regards to income from the monasteries. Subsequent popes, including Ugolino himself, will grant countless exemptions to individual monasteries for a variety of political and compassionate reasons. The result is a monastic order that coalesces around Clare and the Poor Sisters at San Damiano, with several official rules, a multitude of exemptions that govern some but not every house, and monasteries of penitent women run by influential abbesses who interpret Ugolino's rule the way they see fit ignoring sections that don't appeal to their vision of a religious life. Claire is one of these abbesses. While Francis is alive, no one really interferes. The only significant change is that Claire and her sisters become officially enclosed. Francis himself limits the contact between the friars minor and women in a Pope-endorsed rule he writes for his brothers in 1223. The relevant section instructs the friars to avoid, quote, any suspicious dealings or conversations with women. This is quite a vague directive compared to Francis's earlier 1221 rule that detailed a list of prohibited behaviors, including eating from the same plate, traveling together, having personal and intimate conversations, which suggests these were common occurrences that led to at least the appearance of impropriety and needed to be addressed. The rules weren't written specifically with Claire and San Damiano in mind. Perhaps Francis never intended the restrictions to even apply to San Damiano. Instead, they governed the friar's behavior with women they encounter whilst on preaching tours. The laypersons, aristocrats, nuns, penitents, and potential recruits who flock to the wandering Franciscans. Despite Ugolino's rule, things at San Damiano don't really change, except that their numbers swell. With the informal creation of the poor ladies with Claire at its head, Francis and the other friars minor now have a place to send the women they recruit. They also have a template to duplicate elsewhere, further and further afield. Francis sends Claire's sister Agnes to Monticelli near Florence around 1219 to govern the monastery of the Holy Sepulchre in the image of San Damiano. Like Claire, Agnes is initially unwilling to go, And even though she proves to be a competent abbess, it seems she forever regrets leaving San Damiano. In a heartfelt letter to Claire full of anguish, Agnes describes her sadness at being separated from her sister and friends. This feeling must have only increased when Beatrice, Claire and Agnes' youngest sister, and their mother, Ortolana, both joined San Damiano about a decade later. Despite the uniformity of practice that Ugolino had hoped for, two diverging groupings of female penitents begin to arise. Those who are officially bound by Ugolino's rule, but in practice follow Claire and Francis's rule, and those that accept property and adhere overtly to Ugolino's rule. San Damiano remains an outlier. While the monasteries under Ugolino's rule fall under the jurisdiction of Pope Honorius III, San Damiano continues as part of Francis's order, and therefore under Bishop Guido's control. 
As a result, the poor clares continue to identify as a branch of Francis's movement, while sisters in the other monasteries recognize Ugolino as their founder. San Damiano's intimate connection with Francis grants them special status that the church grudgingly permits due to Francis's popularity and celebrity. The papacy would soon tighten its grip, however, and attempt to unify all of these monasteries under one rule, with Clare's monastery as its symbolic head. Before this happens, however, two critically important events occur. Firstly, Ugolino becomes pope. Secondly, Francis dies and becomes a saint. About a year before his death in 1225, Francis convalesces at San Damiano. It's here that the Pavarello composes the Canticle of Exhortation to St. Clare and her sisters. Listen, little poor ones called by the Lord, who have come together from many parts and provinces. Live always in truth, that you may die in obedience. Do not look at the life outside, for that of the Spirit is better. I beg you through great love to use with discretion the alms which the Lord gives you. Those who are weighed down by sickness, and the others who are wearied because of them, all of you, bear it in peace. For you will sell this fatigue at a very high price, and each one of you will be crowned queen in heaven with the Virgin Mary. Francis writes the poem to console the sisters. It's very clear he's not getting better. In 1226, Francis's health takes a drastic turn for the worse. He leaves San Damiano for his beloved Porti Uncula. Claire is also deathly ill. Her extreme asceticism is taking its toll. A friar residing at San Damiano delivers a message to Francis. Claire wishes to see him one last time. The entreaty moves Francis, who writes a blessing for Claire and the poor sisters. He hands the note to a friar with instructions. Go and take this letter to Lady Clare, and tell her to lay aside all grief and sorrow over not being able to see me now. Let her know, too, that before she dies, both she and her sisters will see me and receive the greatest consolation from me. But it's not to be. Francis dies that very night. The next day, the friars minor and Bishop Guido lead a funeral procession to San Damiano. They pass the iron-grated communion window that allows access from the enclosed monastery of San Damiano to the outside world, and pause to allow the poor sisters and Claire to say their final goodbyes. Francis and Claire don't have a lot of contact after Claire settles into San Damiano, although his deep affection for her and her sisters is attested in many surviving sources. A number of legendary meetings between Francis and Claire appear in some of the later St. Francis hagiographies. In one story, Claire sends a message to Francis, pleading to share a meal together. Francis agrees and decides to host Claire at Porti Uncula, giving her permission to leave the enclosure of her monastery for the small church where Francis cut her hair so many years ago. While the friends have dinner and catch up, a bright light shines from the building. From afar, it looks as if the church and the surrounding wood are all ablaze. Villagers hasten to Porti Uncula to extinguish the flames, only to discover Francis and Claire deep in conversation, surrounded by a miraculous fire. Claire would outlive Francis by 27 years. It's only upon Francis' death that Claire emerges from Francis' shadow to make her own path. It's now that her own struggles and victories are fought and one. On the 19th of March, 1227, Ugolino succeeds Honorius III as Pope. He takes the name Gregory IX. From this point forward, we'll refer to Ugolino as Gregory. The rule he set up to govern the monasteries will still be called Ugolino's rule. Pope Gregory continues to standardize the houses of female penitents. Shortly after Francis's death, he places San Damiano and all the affiliated monasteries under the pastoral and spiritual care of the friars minor. John Parenti, 
the current general minister or leader of the Franciscans, is now in charge of all of the Ugolino monasteries. In July of 1228, Gregory travels to Assisi to formally canonize St. Francis. We discussed the reasons for the swift, record-breaking canonization process for Francis in the previous episodes. Gregory is shoring up his political currency by aligning himself with Francis. Claire, who is widely known as Francis's protege, has similar clout. Pope Gregory pays a visit to San Damiano during the festivities around the canonization. His presence provides great symbolic and ceremonial significance for himself and also for Claire. But the Pope has another reason for an audience with the abbess. He hopes to persuade Claire to fall in line over the last significant contention that separates San Damiano from all the others, owning property. Catherine A. Mooney describes the situation. The poverty experiment had not gone well. Nuns were suffering in monasteries too poor to sustain them, and the Franciscan brothers taking care of these nuns were needed for ecclesiastical service. To address this, Gregory the Ninth decided to endow women's monasteries with revenue-generating properties, transforming the ideal of living radical poverty into mere rhetoric. It's not that Gregory disagrees with the philosophy behind living like Christ in poverty. He genuinely applauds the poor lady's desire to do so. It's just not practical. Dangerous, in fact. Gregory entreats Claire to accept gifts of land to be owned corporately by San Damiano. These assets will generate income to free the poor ladies from the worry of providing for their mortal needs. Concerned she might decline to avoid betraying the pledge of poverty she made to Francis, Gregory reassures her. If you fear for your vow, we absolve you from it. Claire's reply is very clear. Holy Father, I have absolutely no desire ever to be absolved from the following of Christ. Eyewitnesses from Acts support Claire's absolute intransigence on poverty. Sister Pacifica says Claire could, quote, never be persuaded to desire anything for herself or to receive any possession for herself or the monastery. Sister Benvenuta of Perugia adds, neither Pope Gregory nor the Bishop of Ostia could ever make her consent to receive any possessions. The issue is at a stalemate. Months later, on August 18th, Gregory appoints his nephew, Cardinal Rinaldo, as the Cardinal Protector of the 24 enclosed monasteries. Rinaldo writes a letter addressed to all of them, listing San Damiano first, indicating the importance of Claire and her group of penitents. The missive unifies all 24 as one under the Ugolino rule. A document from Gregory to Claire, dated September 17, 1228, is Gregory's response to a letter Claire wrote him immediately after receiving Rinaldo's inflammatory decree. Claire's letter hasn't survived. Luckily, though, letter-writing etiquette of the day necessitated a summary of the correspondence before the reply. So we know Claire's lost letter is a declaration that she isn't afraid of the perils poverty might entail. She poetically and politely reminds the Pope that just as God feeds the birds of the sky and clothes the lilies of the field, so shall he protect the poor ladies of San Damiano. Claire will not submit to the ownership of property, corporate or otherwise. Remarkably, Gregory grants Claire an exemption, but rather than an outright ban on property, he grants San Damiano the privilege to refuse gifts from anyone. This isn't quite the same thing as the Franciscan view of poverty, but the wording permits Claire's order to maintain the lifestyle she and her sisters have chosen. Pope Gregory is playing the long game. So is Claire. And she finds an unexpected ally in the form of a princess from Bohemia. Agnes of Prague is a saint and princess born on the 20th of January, 1211, in Bohemia, the western half of what is now the Czech Republic. She is the youngest daughter of King Premisil Ottokar I and Queen Constance of Hungary. King Ottokar is the first officially recognized ruler of the Kingdom of Bohemia, which was previously only a duchy within the Holy Roman Empire. 
Both Pope Innocent III and the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II recognized the elevation in status of both the territory and the man who now rules it. As such, King Ottokar, Queen Constance, and Princess Agnes all become embroiled in the battles, both political and literal, between the competing powers of the church and empire. We've discussed the power struggles between the papacy and the Holy Roman Empire before. The Pope, based in Italy, is the spiritual head of every Christian, be they a pauper or prince. The Holy Roman Emperor, based in modern-day Germany, is the secular ruler of a vast territory that, at its greatest extent now in the 1200s, encompasses about a third of Europe, from Poland to France, and all the lands from the North Sea to halfway down the Italian boot, ending in the province of Perugia, where Assisi is. The two rulers are meant to govern together for the spiritual and secular welfare of Christians. In reality, they're more often adversaries than allies, each deeming the other a subject to their rule. From the age of three, Princess Agnes's education is entrusted to various monasteries in the Holy Roman Empire. First, in Silesia, now Poland, under the care of Cistercian nuns led by St. Hedwig of Andex. Then, back in her native Prague, looked after by a priory of canonesses, who are female penitents. In 1219, the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick asks King Ottokar for Agnes's hand in marriage to his son, Prince Henry. This is a huge honor, one that would link the aristocratic Bohemian line to the imperial family. A year later, a nine-year-old Agnes leaves Prague for the prestigious court of Duke Leopold VI in Vienna where her schooling continues with focus on the proper etiquette and education befitting the future queen of the Holy Roman Empire. Duke Leopold has other plans. Whilst showing Princess Agnes every courtesy to her face, he conspires for his own daughter, Margaret, to take Agnes's place. Leopold convinces Pope Honorius III to support Margaret's marriage to Prince Henry, likely promising political favors in return. Honorius agrees and issues a dispensation that dissolves the wedding contract between Prince Henry and Princess Agnes. On November 5th, 1225, Margaret becomes Henry's wife. A few months later in spring, King Ottokar declares war on Duke Leopold and loses. The royal family of Bohemia is humiliated. According to hagiographies, Agnes isn't so concerned. Worldly matters like status and marriage alliances aren't important to her. She'll be the one rejecting other marriages to rulers from various German states and England, much to her father's disappointment. Princess Agnes is described as saintly even as a child, in a fashion typical of the hagiography genre. A story about Conrad of Marburg, a German priest and nobleman, demonstrates this. After his defeat against Leopold, Agnes's father begins raising an army for a second attack. Conrad, a religious zealot, happens to be in Bohemia at the same time, raising an army of his own for the Sixth Crusade. Conrad's efforts pull away much of the manpower and funds that would have gone to Ottokar's war chest. King Ottokar is outraged. Here's a passage from Joan Mueller's book to tell us more. Ottokar gave the order to have the papal preacher captured and assassinated. As Conrad lay on the floor with his enemy preparing to behead him, he begged for the opportunity to confess and receive communion before his demise. The 15-year-old Agnes ran to him, helped the preacher up, and escorted him to a nearby chapel. When he returned, the king repented of his anger, certainly thanks to Agnes's petitions, and received Conrad's forgiveness. The saintliness of a teenaged Agnes is clearly portrayed. King Ottokar dies in 1230 without securing a husband or marriage alliance for his daughter. Agnes's eldest brother, Wenceslas, inherits the throne and receives a message from Emperor Frederick. Still wishing to have an alliance with the ruling family of Bohemia, the emperor asks again for Agnes's hand in marriage, this time to be his own wife and queen. Agnes isn't impressed, and turns to Gregory IX, who's only been pope for three years. She beseeches him to come to her aid. She doesn't want to marry Frederick or anyone, and wishes to remain a virgin, to live the rest of her life 
devoted to religion. I can imagine Pope Gregory receiving Princess Agnes's letter with delight. It's now within his power to stick it to the emperor by siding with Agnes, which he readily does with open arms. Agnes's brother, King Wenceslaus, also remarkably sides with his sister. Perhaps the king weighs up the options, defying the pope or the emperor, and decides it's safer to side with Gregory rather than Frederick. When the emperor receives Agnes's rejection via Wenceslaus, he replies masterfully, If this offense had been committed against us by any man, under no circumstances would we refrain from avenging the insult of such contempt. However, because she has chosen a lord who is greater than we are, we do not consider this to be any insult against us. Instead, we believe that this action has been inspired by God. Emperor Frederick cannily accepts Agnes's rejection as a divine mandate. In doing so, he not only retains his honor, but emerges graciously as a noble servant of God. The following year, Agnes's 24-year-old cousin Elizabeth dies. Elizabeth is also a princess, the daughter of King Andrew II of Hungary and Gertrude of Morania. At the age of 14, Elizabeth weds Louis IV, a German noble who is a keen supporter of the Holy Roman Emperor. When Elizabeth is 16, she meets the Friars Minor, who had arrived in Germany around 1220. Elizabeth is so moved by Francis's way of life that she moves in with the Friars. Her husband Louis encourages her, believing that an association with these holy men will earn God's favor. It doesn't. Whilst on his way to fight in the Sixth Crusade, Louis succumbs to the plague. A legal battle ensues between Louis's family and Elizabeth. Louis's brother Henry assumes the regency and seizes all of Elizabeth's property. The princess flees her home in Wartburg Castle for her uncle's protection in Marburg, a day's journey to the east. Our old friend Pope Gregory IX appoints Conrad to represent Elizabeth in court. This is the same zealot Conrad whom Agnes rescued from her father's wrath. The religious extremist would have a profound and deadly influence on Elizabeth in the years to come. He forces her to adopt extreme fasting practices. He subjects her to beatings to teach humility and to punish her for lapses in the life-threatening asceticism he demands. It's because of Conrad's abuse that Elizabeth dies at so young an age. Before this tragic end, however, Conrad convinces the court to rule in Elizabeth's favor. With her substantial dowry now in possession, she opens a hospital in Marburg, which she manages with help from the Friars Minor until her death. Princess Elizabeth, whom Gregory canonizes in 1235, is an early member of what would become the Third Order of St. Francis, a branch of lay penitents who aren't officially nuns or monks, but still live according to the rules of St. Francis. Elizabeth has a deep connection with the Friars Minor. She receives a blessing from Francis himself before his death, acknowledging her good work. Back in Prague, Princess Agnes is greatly influenced by her cousin's religious calling. Soon after Elizabeth's death, Agnes founds a monastery with a hospital of her own, dedicated to St. Francis. She pours all of her wealth into it. Agnes's mother, Queen Constance, also endows the hospital with her estates. Agnes then convinces her younger brother, Premisil, to donate the land he had promised her to the hospital instead. In 1234, King Wenceslas places his sister's monastery and hospital under the protection of the crown. The Friars Minor, who arrive in Prague a year after Elizabeth's death, are engaged to manage Agnes's hospital. The numerous royal endowments keep the organization overflowing with wealth. As a result, the Friars Minor exchange the rule of St. Francis for the rule of St. Augustine, which allows the collective ownership of property. They then transform themselves into a military order called the Crusaders of the Red Cross and Star. It's a common practice for societies of Christian knights, who are also monks and penitents, to run hospitals attached to monasteries. The Knights of St. Thomas, who were sanctioned by Pope Gregory, and the Knights Hospitaller are two of the most famous examples. Both began as religious charities to help the sick and wounded, 
and transformed into military organizations under the Pope's command. The monastery founded by Agnes is a double win for the Pope. A new female Franciscan monastery under his charge has been founded, and Emperor Frederick has been prevented from making a political alliance with Agnes's brother, King Wenceslas. Pope Gregory sends Princess Agnes his congratulations. Despite your charm and youth, Agnes, you imitated the most blessed Agnes. Like her, you did not permit yourself to be deceived by worldly pleasantries or seduced by temporal power or glory. Rather, despising the enticements of the world and the riches of earthly affairs, you compelled the flesh to serve the spirit. In doing so, you left behind everything transitory so that you might choose in purity of heart and body to serve your heavenly spouse in the religious community of poor and closed nuns. Pope Gregory compliments Princess Agnes by comparing her with the Roman martyr of the same name. Recall that Claire's sister Catherine was renamed Agnes by Francis after this same martyr. It's significant that Gregory doesn't mention the Franciscan origins of Princess Agnes's community of women. He refers to them as poor and closed nuns, not poor ladies. In 1234, Claire learns of Princess Agnes's rejection of Emperor Frederick's marriage proposal for a religious life of poverty. The abbess sends the first of four letters to the much younger Agnes. The message is a welcome, a pointed one. Claire extols the virtues of a life of poverty and, like Pope Gregory, compares the princess to her 4th century martyr namesake. The purpose of Claire's letter is to ensure Agnes's monastery joins the fold as an ally. Princess Agnes must be convinced to renounce property, to follow San Damiano's example, rather than adopt the Ugolino rule Pope Gregory wishes to implement. It turns out Claire has nothing to worry about. Princess Agnes's views are totally aligned with Claire's. At some point, Agnes begins separating the very wealthy income-generating hospital from the monastery and she makes it very clear that the monastery will no longer accept gifts or endowments of any kind. Perhaps it's Claire's letter that affects this change. Or maybe Agnes always held this view, given her early association with the Franciscans in Prague. It's all a moot point, however, because Pope Gregory refuses to grant Agnes the same dispensation on poverty he had granted Claire. Here's a passage from the decision. We have decided that the Hospital of St. Francis, situated next to your monastery, which you, daughter and abbess, built on land of the Roman Church, is to be conceded to that monastery with its appurtenances forever. We also decree that the same hospital, with all its goods, cannot be separated from the monastery by any means or plan. Let the income of its possessions instead fall to the use of yourselves and those who succeed you always recognizing the authority of the Apostolic See. Claire's second letter to Agnes, written sometime between 1235 and 1238, addresses an ongoing battle over property, which Agnes must have communicated to Claire via traveling Franciscans or in a letter now lost. Given Claire's response, it seems Agnes is tiring of the struggle, close to giving in. An unnamed figure, referred to only as someone, has been advising Agnes against poverty. This mysterious someone is likely Pope Gregory. Claire is very savvy to not name him in case her letter is intercepted or read by unsympathetic parties. In her letter, Claire counsels Agnes to ignore the bad advice and place her trust instead in another. Follow the advice of our venerable father, our brother Elias, Minister General. Prefer his advice to the advice of others, and consider it more precious to you than any gift. Indeed, if someone tells you something else, or suggests anything to you that may hinder your perfection, and that seems contrary to your divine vocation, even though you must respect him, still do not follow his advice. Instead, poor virgin, embrace the poor Christ. Brother Elias was Francis's close friend. He's the current minister general of the Friars Minor, 
one of the brothers still allied with Claire and Francis's original pledge to poverty. Since the Poverello's death, many Franciscan communities own property. Some individuals even work as agents for the church. Not Elias. He's the only one Agnes can trust. Claire informs Agnes in a sort of code that any advice contrary to embracing poverty should be ignored, even if the advice comes from the Pope. She cautions Agnes to maintain, quote, a quick pace, light step, and feet that do not stumble, so that your walking does not raise any dust. In short, defy Pope Gregory in secret, and with utmost discretion. This is quite extraordinary, a tactic Claire herself employs throughout her life. No matter what rule popes and bishops force her to follow at San Damiano, Claire simply ignores any directive that contravenes her own beliefs. As ever, Claire's advice is carefully crafted. She closes with, Embrace the poor Christ. Who could find fault in that? Agnes heeds Claire's counsel. The princess turns to Brother Elias and also seeks assistance from her most powerful ally, her brother, King Wenceslas. In 1237, King Wenceslas writes a letter to Pope Gregory. First, I thank you profusely, most excellent sanctity, for the persevering and kind affection that you continually bestow on your very dear daughter and my beloved sister, Lady Agnes, of the Order of Poor Ladies. She herself witnesses to the fact that she never recalls having asked your sanctity anything that she did not soon receive from you. Because of this, your kindness draws me with all my power, which lies in my kingdom, family, in-laws, and friends alike, to you, and to the whole Roman Curia in all devotion. Agnes's brother cleverly refers to his sister's monastery as the Order of the Poor Ladies, the same name as Claire's monastery in San Damiano, which had already been granted the privilege of poverty by Pope Gregory. The king continues by pledging his services to the Pope, quote, both public and private. As long as Gregory condescends to Agnes's request, that her community in Prague be a mirror of San Damiano, exempt from owning property, a separate entity from the income-generating hospital. Pope Gregory relents. His reply lays bare his irritation and impatience. It's fantastically catty. Agnes's monastery will now be governed like San Damiano, under a version of the rule of St. Benedict. Gregory separates the hospital from the monastery, and officially places it under the care of the monastic knights. A year later, in 1238, Gregory grants the monastery the privilege of poverty, similar to the terms for San Damiano. Property isn't forbidden. The monastery just can't be forced to accept possessions. For Agnes, these concessions aren't good enough. What she desires is to live under the rule of St. Francis, not a watered-down version based on the rule of St. Benedict, which doesn't prohibit property and relaxes the fasting regime in Prague due to the harsher climate there. Agnes writes her own rule, then sends it to the Pope for approval. Pope Gregory concedes nothing. Agnes's rule is unacceptable. She's to stop harassing him and do as she's told. Brother Elias's meddling doesn't go unnoticed. Gregory takes a shot at the friar and refers to him as someone who is acting out of enthusiasm rather than intelligence. The reply is very angry, but I kind of understand where he's coming from. The Pope is in the midst of reforming monastic orders, combating perceived heresy, and waging war against the Holy Roman Emperor. I think it's surprising that he replied at all, or didn't make a lackey do it. From his perspective, Claire has already accepted his rule, so why can't Agnes do the same? Like Claire, she can simply ignore bits she doesn't like, since her own rule is far more strict than the one Gregory has imposed. Agnes turns once again to Claire. Claire's third letter to Agnes is a caution. She reminds the princess that the fight has been won. The monastery in Prague has been divested from the hospital. Agnes and her sisters now truly live in poverty. The letter contains metaphoric references to a mirror, a common symbol in Christian theology. 
On the one hand, it represents Christ, a reflection of the resurrection, of goodness. On the other, it's the faithful themselves, reflecting the tenets of the Christian faith. Claire tells Agnes, place your mind in the mirror of eternity. So rather than stress out about what Pope Gregory has yet to grant her, Agnes ought to be a reflection of God, embrace humility and the life she's chosen. Claire also addresses Agnes's preferred fasting regime, which is harsh like the one Claire practices herself. But she dissuades Agnes from obsessing over it with a reminder that poverty is at the core of the life both have chosen. Emboldened by Claire's support, Agnes decides to reply to Pope Gregory's very angry letter. She doesn't bring up the rejection of her rule and only asks for an exemption on fasting. Could her community please follow the same rules as San Damiano? The response is brief. It repeats Agnes's request and agrees to it. Whilst counseling Princess Agnes on how to approach Pope Gregory, Claire confronts him on her own front. In 1230, two years after securing the privilege of poverty for San Damiano, Claire receives Pope Gregory's communique that access to her monastery by male monastics is now prohibited except with his permission. The decree covers all of the Ugolino monasteries and is particularly strict regarding those of enclosed penitents. Previously, the minister general, the head of the Friars Minor, was in charge of access to the poor ladies, a responsibility they all wielded to allow confessors and priests into the enclosed monastery so they could tend to the penitents' spiritual needs, as well as provide food, clothing, basic supplies procured from begging. Perhaps most importantly to Claire, the minister general's relaxed stance meant brothers Elias, Leo, and other Friars Minor were regular visitors. Pope Gregory's decree that he alone controls access to female monasteries by men threatens the everyday dynamics at San Damiano. According to the legend, a defiant Claire proclaims, Let him now take away from us all of the brothers, since he has taken away those who provide us with the food that is vital. The vital food Claire refers to isn't just physical food to eat, but spiritual nourishment and the vitality of her deep friendships with the friars. In retaliation, Claire dismisses all of the friars currently at the monastery. She'd rather starve than be deprived of the company of friars whom her sisters have come to depend on and love like family. Pope Gregory is made aware of Claire's position and subsequent dismissal of the men. He immediately backtracks and clarifies the ruling, granting Franciscans a fair bit of freedom to come and go in the enclosed monasteries. The mighty Abbess Claire has won again. While Claire and Agnes fight Gregory's rulings, the Pope has been literally fighting Emperor Frederick II and his armies for years. On Palm Sunday, 1239, Gregory excommunicates Frederick for the third time, this time due to escalating armed conflicts. The Franciscans' loyalties are split between papal and imperial factions. Both sides use the Friars Minor to spread propaganda about the other. Gregory's advisors counsel him to write Princess Agnes and appeal to her brother, the King of Bohemia, to side with the papacy. It doesn't end well for Gregory. The Pope becomes increasingly isolated. Many of his allies defect. On August 22, 1241, Gregory dies in Rome, essentially imprisoned by Frederick's armies who surround the Papal States. The cardinals, whose loyalties like everyone in Christendom are split, meet to elect a new Pope. Frederick kidnaps two of the pro-papacy cardinals, hoping to sway the balance of votes in his favor. But a pro-papacy cardinal is elected, Celestine IV. Celestine, already an old man, dies about two weeks after being elected due to the stress of recent events and the ongoing struggles with the emperor. He doesn't even live long enough for a coronation. Celestine's successor is Innocent IV, another anti-imperial cleric who will have a profound effect on Claire and reign over her death.
On November 13, 1243, Pope Innocent IV writes to Princess Agnes. It's a reply to a request to instate the rule of St. Francis at the Princess's Monastery in Prague, a request Pope Gregory had already denied. Clearly, Agnes sees tactical advantage to appeal to this new pope, who might not be aware of what had already transpired. Innocent is well aware of Gregory's stance on the matter, though, and shares his predecessor's concerns about poverty. The political situation has worsened since Pope Gregory's death. Church coffers are emptying due to escalating conflicts against Frederick, and the alms that were once free-flowing from the general public are drying up in this tough time. Without an income, the risk of starvation for every Damianite community that follows Clare's strict observances is very real. Pope Innocent IV's answer to Princess Agnes is an unequivocal no. Agnes isn't the only abbess appealing to Innocent. In the following year, the heads of communities as far away as Spain contact the Pope to express their frustration at having to abide by two contradictory rules. The rule of St. Benedict, as prescribed under the Ugolino rule, and the rule passed to them via Francis. The former prescribes the corporate ownership of property, while the latter prohibits it. Innocent attempts to appease the abbesses by declaring that the only sections of the rule of St. Benedict that apply to them are those that govern obedience to the Pope, the renunciation of personal property, and chastity. Princess Agnes, for one, isn't mollified. Because of her family connections, she wins another concession. King Wenceslas had recently defied Pope Innocent over a candidate to become bishop. Innocent writes Agnes on September 20th, 1245, would she please persuade her brother to accept his chosen man for the office. Agnes expresses her joy at being able to help the Pope, as long as the Pope also finds joy in helping her. Nine days later, King Wenceslas welcomes Innocent's candidate in a letter full of praise for the new bishop. Shortly after, Franciscan chapters and Damianite monasteries receive a papal decree that broadens the access and responsibilities of Franciscan brothers to their Damianite sisters. In addition to entering enclosed houses for the purposes of religion, health and safety, providing food and support, the Friars Minor may now, quote, come for other reasonable and honorable matters, and may themselves approach or send brothers of their order when they see fit to the doors, grills, and parlors of those monasteries. The concession comes with a face-saving decree. All of the communities affiliated with Clare's San Damiano must obey the rule Pope Gregory gave them when he was still a cardinal, the Ugolino rule as most have been doing for many years. At the same time, Innocent makes revisions to the Franciscans themselves, whose practices had already strayed from the Pavarello's original teachings. The Friars Minor are openly employed as agents of the Church to destabilize Emperor Frederick's reputation and rule. Brothers who are educated priests, former aristocrats, are made in charge over the commoners. These highborn managers are even permitted to conduct financial transactions. Crescentius, the current minister general, remembered for his cruelty and disdain for traditionalists still clinging to the old ways of poverty, commissions a new hagiography about St. Francis from Thomas of Celano. It recasts Francis and Clare in a light that favors innocent's vision for all Franciscans, male and female one that sees monasteries become self-sufficient through the collective ownership of property in absolute obedience to the Pope. Towards this same end, Innocent writes a brand new Forma Vita, yet another rule to govern every Damianite community. It's the first one that contains Francis's own words and ironically embraces property over poverty. The document addresses a common complaint amongst monasteries that they were bound by two rules. From now on, innocence rule is the only rule. The Forma Vita also attempts to unify the very different practices across the order, given countless exemptions granted by Pope Gregory. Distributed to the abbesses on the 6th of August, 1247, the rule contains dispensations around corporate ownership of property, 
as well as relaxed fasting and enclosure policies so that all Damianite monasteries are united under the most lax practices followed by any community. Innocent's rule also meticulously details what sisters should wear, how they should wear it. This is in contrast to Gregory's rule, which simply stated they shouldn't be seen. A similar comprehensive section is added to circumscribe sleeping arrangements. Catherine M. Mooney suggests the expanded points are necessary to rein in behaviors that had deviated the most from orthodoxy. Pope Innocent IV's Forma Vita is the first to unite the Order of San Damiano with the Friars Minor. Joan Mueller points out that Clare's community, once referred to by Pope Gregory as the poor enclosed nuns of the Order of San Damiano, are called by Pope Innocent the Order of the Poor Sisters that Blessed Francis founded. The Damianites are now officially born of the same tradition as the Franciscans, so it's only fitting that the Franciscan friars should have direct oversight over the Franciscan sisters, a responsibility formally held by Cardinal Rinaldo. It's this particular change, rather than the decree on collectively owning property, that seems to be the unraveling of Innocent's plans. Firstly, many of the friars minor totally ignore their increased duties as the Damianites' keepers, including the minister general, John of Parma. Other friars overzealously embrace their newfound power over the penitent women. Claire's sister, Agnes, is one of many abbesses who writes to the Pope, alarmed by the obedience these eager friars now demand of them. Secondly, the insertion of the friars into what was once the sole jurisdiction of Rinaldo finds the cardinal insulted. In an act of supreme passive aggression, Rinaldo stops performing his duties as the cardinal protector of the sisters. On June 17, 1248, Innocent reverses the decision over governance. Cardinal Rinaldo's Cold War has succeeded. His pride massaged, Rinaldo acts quickly. Meddlesome friars are removed. Isolated monasteries receive the resources they need. The cardinal even convinces many of the Damianites to accept property, while those who refuse, Claire San Damiano, Agnes's Monticelli, and Princess Agnes's Prague, aren't forced to do so. The result is that the communities within the so-called unified Order of San Damiano are further split between a minority living in poverty and those in possession of considerable wealth. To rectify this, Pope Innocent sends Rinaldo to San Damiano, where he oversees the drafting of a new rule, one for San Damiano only, that will hopefully bring it closer to the mainstream of the order. Claire is intimately involved, as likely are the other sisters at the monastery, and Franciscans close to Claire, such as brothers Leo and Elias. This latest rule, the rule of St. Claire, is much closer to Francis's way of life, and guarantees San Damiano's right to poverty. It also makes concessions to address the Pope's concerns about the women's vulnerability. San Damiano is now permitted to own property, but only what is necessary to protect and enclose the sisters. Adjacent property for subsistence farming is also permitted. Unlike other monasteries, rent, the selling of land rights to farm or hunt, and all other income are forbidden. Sisters may receive gifts from loved ones. They may even keep them if they're needed, or else they're to be given away. Gifts of cash are also allowed to provide for an individual's needs. Furthermore, as has always been Claire's way, the monastery is governed by an abbess who rules through consensus and a system of checks and balances to ensure harmony. Interestingly, there are provisions in the new rule that allow sisters to leave the monastery for, quote, a useful, reasonable, evident, and approved purpose. Four Franciscan friars are mandated to be present at the monastery to look after the sisters' needs. Claire's stricter rules on fasting are finally implemented, though not without exception for those who need more to survive. And finally, the text from two letters by Francis to Claire are included in her rule. Because by divine inspiration you have made yourselves daughters and handmaids of the Most High King, the Father of Heaven, and have espoused yourselves to the Holy Spirit, choosing to live according to the perfection of the Holy Gospel, 
I resolve and promise for myself and for my brothers to have always that same loving care and special solicitude for you as I have for them. This letter records Francis's promise that he and the Friars Minor will always care for Claire and her sisters. And here's the second letter from Francis to Claire. I, little brother Francis, wish to follow the life and poverty of our Most High Lord Jesus Christ and of his Most Holy Mother and to persevere in this until the end. I ask and counsel you, my ladies, to persevere also in this Most Holy Life and poverty. Keep vigilant watch that you never depart from this because of the teaching or advice of anyone. On September 16th, 1252, Reinaldo gives his approval to the rule created by Claire with a simple statement. You have chosen to live bodily and closed and to serve the Lord in highest poverty, that in freedom of soul you may be the Lord's servants. It's now up to Pope Innocent to approve or reject this new rule. Sometime in 1253, shortly after submitting the rule to Rome, Claire writes a fourth and final letter to Princess Agnes of Bohemia, a letter dictated from her deathbed. Fifteen years separate the third and fourth letters. The tone in this last letter is very affectionate. Claire addresses Agnes as her special daughter. The change in tone suggests the possibility of additional correspondence that's been lost, through which the two women have become friends. Nevertheless, a long time has elapsed. Claire apologizes for the delay, no doubt caused by the ongoing battle between empire and papacy, making the delivery of letters a treacherous affair. Claire uses the image of a mirror once again as a symbol of Christ, and expounds on the theological mysteries of Christ's life his humble birth, a life of poverty, and a painful death filled with suffering. The letter ends with a plea for the younger abbess to pray for her poor little mother. Not too long after the letter to Agnes is sent, Pope Innocent IV arrives at San Damiano. The dying abbess receives his visit as an honor. Shortly after the Pope's departure on August 10, 1253, a brother arrives with a document from Assisi, one that bears the papal seal. Pope Innocent IV has approved Clare's rule, a rule we now call the Rule of St. Clare. Why Innocent approved it remains a mystery. It contravenes his own strategy and views on female monastics, dividing rather than uniting the Damianite monasteries. Perhaps it's due to Reinaldo's influence or the influence of Brother Elias, who dies earlier in April. The only clue we have is a cryptic line of marginalia in Innocent's own hand on the original manuscript of the rule. It reads, For reasons known to me and to the protector of the monastery, so be it. In the days following receipt of the papal bull, Claire remains bedridden in a haze. She's dying. Friends and family surround her, including her blood sister Agnes, who has returned at last to San Damiano from her own monastery near Florence to see Claire one last time. Brothers Leo and Angelo are also present. A vision Sister Benvenuta has is recorded in Acts. A multitude of virgins, all shining brightly, dressed in white, wearing crowns of gold, enter the room. The brightest and most beautiful of them all lays a near invisible veil over Claire. The mystical figure then leans in to plant a kiss on Claire's mouth, after which they all disappear. Claire's last words are spoken on August 11th, 1253. Go securely and in peace, my blessed soul, and you, Lord, are blessed because you have created me. Numerous miracles are associated with St. Clair. Many were added to her hagiography in the centuries after her death. One story takes place in 1240, at the height of the armed conflict between the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II and Pope Gregory IX. Frederick has sent mercenaries to attack Assisi. After ransacking the town, they approach San Damiano. 
The sisters are in a state of panic, but a sickly Claire rises calmly from her bed. She holds aloft a monstrance, a metallic vessel that carries the Eucharist, and stands in the doorway of the monastery. The sheer brilliance of the Eucharist, which to the faithful is literally the body of Christ, frightens away the attackers. This moment from Claire's legend is often depicted by artists who paint or sculpt the abbess holding a monstrance. In an anecdote that takes place towards the end of Claire's life, the evening's mass has begun. A very unwell and bedridden Claire is troubled she's unable to attend. Suddenly, the priest's voice sounds around her as if he's in the room. Even more remarkably, a moving image of the service appears on the wall, a miraculous projection. It's this story that makes Claire the patron saint of television, an honor bestowed upon her by Pope Pius XII in 1958. Recent compilations of saint stories now list Claire as the patron saint of screens in general. It's likely through a touchscreen device or a computer, both of which are protected by Claire, that you're listening to this saint podcast episode. And it's a poetic coincidence that the region in California where touchscreen devices were invented is named after Claire, Silicon Valley in the county of Santa Clara. An account by Bartolomeo da Pisa from 1399, over a century after Claire's death, tells of a group of sailors from Pisa bound for Sardinia. A ferocious storm interrupts their journey, threatening to capsize their ship. In desperation, sailors begin making pleas to the Virgin Mary, Christ, God himself, and other saints. The storm continues unabated until someone cries out to St. Clair. A brilliant beam of sunlight pierces the black clouds and dispels the storm. The miraculous light stays with the sailors, trained on the ship like a spotlight until they reach the safety of the Sardinian port. A number of other posthumous miracles attributed to Claire involve wolves who snatch away children. All are returned after prayers to Claire. A painting by Giovanni Di Paolo from the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston shows a child in pink whose severed arm is in a wolf's mouth. A second wolf looks as if they're sleeping, or maybe it's another depiction of the first wolf, struck down by Claire, who's been invoked by the child's mother. The many attacking wolf stories associated with Claire further link her to Francis, who tamed the wolf of Gubbio. Head to the Saint Podcast website to see paintings of Claire and the wolf and other depictions of this saint. Claire has mystical visions throughout her life. We've already discussed the vision she has of her birth. She also dreams of Saint Francis after his death. Here's the account from the Testament. Once, in a vision, it seemed to her she brought a bowl of hot water to St. Francis, along with a towel for drying his hands. She was climbing a very high stairway and was going very quickly, almost as though she were going on level ground. When she reached St. Francis, the saint bared his breast and said to Lady Claire, Come, take, and drink. After she had sucked from it, the saint admonished her to imbibe once again. After she did so, what she had tasted was so sweet and delightful she in no way could describe it. After she had imbibed, that nipple or opening of the breast from which the milk comes remained between the lips of Blessed Claire. After she took what remained in her mouth in her hands, it seemed to her it was gold so clear and bright that everything was seen in it as in a mirror. We have another reference to a mirror and also to milk. We'll be creating a special Saint Podcast episode in partnership with the Welcome Collection in London, which delves into our relationship with the substance and its place in politics, society, and culture, as well as the many saints whose legends involve milk. Stay tuned for more information on this upcoming special episode. A year after Claire's death, Pope Innocent IV also dies. His successor is Pope Alexander IV the first Franciscan Pope, a man who knew Francis and Claire personally when he was one of the Friars Minor. On the 26th of September, 1255, Pope Alexander canonizes Claire. Her body is moved from a grave in San Damiano 
to the newly built Basilica of St. Clair in Assisi, where it remains today. Although her corpse was excavated from beneath the high altar, then placed in a glass case within a purposely built crypt in the 19th century. A mask covers Claire's remains, which can only be seen from the back, accessible only by the Franciscan nuns who live there. Today, all of the Damianites are known as the Order of the Poor Clares. It's a name given to them by Pope Urban IV in 1263, when he writes yet another rule for the collective Ugolino or Damianite monasteries one that effectively puts an end to the question of poverty for good. Every monastery in the Order of the Poor Clares collectively owns property today. Clare won her battles in life, and I suppose you can say she lost after death, just like St. Francis, who was sidelined, even ridiculed, as the order he founded changed necessarily perhaps with the times. Clare's relevance isn't about whether she won or lost. Her views on property and materialism are strikingly modern, as are her democratic methods of governing San Damiano. Claire's story is one of perseverance. It's a story about a network of enclosed women who never meet in person, and the impressive influence they wielded over the most powerful men of the age, amidst radical social upheaval and war, to live and die on their own terms, obeying only the rule they set for themselves. Thank you so much for listening to the fifth episode in our season about mystics. For images of the artworks, people, and topics mentioned, have a look at the Saint Podcast website at www.saintpodcast.com. The word saint is spelled out, S-A-I-N-T. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for updates. And please email us at feedback at saintpodcast.com if you have comments, questions, or suggestions for future episodes. Special thanks to the appropriately named Claire Di McGooey from Houston, Texas, who provided the readings. Claire is an animal lover who works in finance. She's also my cousin. Hi, Claire. All of the original music was composed and performed by my dear friend Amy Vanacore, a talented musician and piano teacher who lives in Portland, Oregon. In the next Mystics episode, we're going to leave behind the Franciscans for now. We'll explore the legend of a monk who was Francis and Claire's contemporary. Unlike Francis and Claire, though, he was an ordained priest an educated man who founded a monastic order based on biblical scholarship, teaching the gospel, and collective ownership of property. He's the patron saint of astronomy, natural sciences, and the archdiocese of Fuzhou in China. According to legend, an apparition of the Virgin Mary taught this saint the rosary, and it's said that before his birth, his mother had a vision in which a dog carrying a burning torch leapt out of her womb. Stay tuned for the story of St. Dominic, the Hound of the Lord. <laughs>